All right, so we are to our scripture reading. We have two scripture passages this evening uh, that correlate with each other. We have Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And Leviticus 16 is the information or the instructions uh, concerning how to do the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, in the Israel's church calendar, worship calendar. Leviticus 16, now the reading of God's word. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so that he will not die. He is not to take, or he is to take some of the bull's blood and with his fingers sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on all the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites." When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on it itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place, and he's to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in a holy place and put on his regular garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh, and offal are to be burned up. The man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native-born or an alien living among you, because on this day atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins." It is a Sabbath of rest, and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar. 
and for the priests and all the people of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. I know that's a long reading, but I hope that since we read Leviticus 16 and the, uh, the ordinance concerning the Day of Atonement, I hope that Hebrews chapter 10, our New Testament reading, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 through 18, will be enlightened to us and for us. And we may understand it better. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 through 18. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. And thus far, the reading of God's holy word, may he bless it to the hands, hearts, and minds of his people. We're also going to be looking at Lord's Day 29 and 30. Lord's Day 29 and 30 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Continuing our conversation, discussion about the Lord's Supper. Are the bread and wine changed into the real body and blood of Christ? The answer is no. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into Christ's blood and does not itself wash away sins, but is simply God's sign and assurance, so too the bread of the Lord's Supper is not changed into the actual body of Christ, even though it is called the body of Christ, in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. Question 79. Why then does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood? Paul uses the words of participation in Christ's body and blood. The answer, Christ has has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood truly nourish our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance And that all of his suffering and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. Lord's Day 30, question 80. How does the Lord's Supper differ from the Roman Catholic Mass? The answer, the Lord's Supper declares to us that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself finished on the cross once for all. It also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grasps us into Christ who with his very body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. But the Mass teaches that the living and the dead do not have their sins forgiven through the suffering of Christ, unless Christ is still offered for them daily by the priests. It also teaches that Christ is bodily present in the form of bread and wine, where Christ is therefore to be worshipped. Thus, the Mass is basically nothing but a denial of the one sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ and a condemnable idolatry. 
Question 81, who are to come to the Lord's table? The answer, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. Hypocrites and those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Question 82. Are those to be admitted to the Lord's Supper who show by what they say and do that they are unbelieving and ungodly? Answer, no. That would dishonor God's covenant and bring down God's anger upon the entire congregation. Therefore, according to the instruction of Christ and his apostles, the Christian church is duty-bound to exclude such people by the official use of the keys of the kingdom until they reform their lives. And that's the teaching of the catechism. Give me just one second to blow my nose, okay? All right, I'm back. Never say that our live streams are not uh, very human and flawed. Nothing, nothing but professionalism going on here, okay? Um, this is what I want you to think of, okay? Here is our opening illustration. I want you to think of a billboard that you see a sign on the side of the road, right? It's an advertisement. Um, for a product, Coke, Coca-Cola. Or I don't want to exclude anybody, Pepsi. Right? Or whatever else that you may like. Um, that is, uh, that's something that you see on, on a billboard on the road, right? You see a Coke or a Pepsi. And let's imagine that you are, you're thirsty, you're thirsty, and you see an advertisement, and it, 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 it's, it's, you know, it, it's somebody drinking a Coke, and, oh, it looks so refreshing. I'm actually really thirsty right now because it is really hot in the sanctuary. Like, I'm sweating, okay? Um, so you see that, right? And let's say somebody's in the car with you, and you look up at that billboard, and you go, oh, you know, I want one of those. I want one of those. Now here's what, I, here's what I want to ask you. When you say you want one of those, are you saying that you want a billboard with a Coke advertisement on it? Or are you saying you want what the billboard represents? That is, you want an actual, you want an actual can of, of Coke, right? You actually want a, a real drink. You're thirsty. You want a drink. You don't want a bill. You don't want a picture of a Coke. You don't want a picture of a Coke. You want what the picture represents, the Coke itself. You want to be refreshed. You're thirsty. And that's exactly what the Lord's Supper is. It's a picture of a Coke but it's pointing us to what the picture represents. The actual, real thing. It's a picture of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but it's pointing us to the real thing. It's pointing us to the real thing. And that's why I named our sermon tonight the spiritual presence of Christ Christ is spiritually present in his supper. Christ is spiritually present in the supper to sustain our souls And unite us 
to his body. Christ is spiritually present in the supper to sustain our souls and unite us to his body. I know that's a lot, but it's exactly what the catechism is telling us. And so I'm trying to get that across to you, okay? We're going to be talking about the nature of the spiritual presence. We're going to be talking about the benefits of the spiritual presence. And we're going to be talking, lastly, about the partakers. Partakers of the spiritual presence. Uh, who, should part, who should partake of Christ's spiritual presence in the supper? Let's start with the nature, right? Question and answer 78 says, are the, are the bread and wine changed into the real body and blood of Christ? And the answer to that question is no. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into Christ's blood and does not itself wash away sins, but is simply God's sign and assurance, the picture of baptism is pointing us to the reality of what Christ has done for us on the cross, right? Pointing us to the real thing. So too, the bread of the Lord's Supper is not changed into the actual body of Christ, even though it is called the body of Christ in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. So, the nature and language of the sacraments is a term that the, that the catechism uses. So then it continues, right? The first part of question and answer 80 talks about the nature as well. It says, The Lord's Supper declares to us that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ, remember? The sacraments are pointing us to that, both baptism and the supper are pointing us to the finished and completed work of Jesus, which he himself finished on the cross once for all. It also declares to us that through that finished and complete work, we are people who have been given the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his very body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. So the nature of the spiritual presence is a nature that is described for us as a picture, a living picture in the bread, in the cup, that point to the living Jesus, that by faith we partake of the bread and are sustained in our souls, and by faith we become more united to his body. That's also his actual body in heaven, but it also is representative of the communal nature of the supper. That is that we are united more to one another because we make up the body of Christ. Um, Leviticus 16 talks about the Day of Atonement, right? And if you remember one thing and that long reading that we had about the Day of Atonement, something that was repeated over and over again was that this is only supposed to be once a year, it's a special occasion, and that Aaron had to go through this strenuous process of, of making sacrifice first for himself because he's a sinner. He couldn't, he, couldn't, um, he couldn't bring the sacrifice without first cleansing himself. He had to wash before he could put on these uh, particular clothes. He had to then make sacrifice for himself and his family before he could enter into the holy place to make a sacrifice. And you move forward to Hebrews chapter 10 and you find that Christ has completed what these signs, what these types, what these shadows were pointing to. His is a once-for-all sacrifice. 
And so what we're doing in the Lord's Supper is not representing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ over and over again because that was a once for all. But what we are doing is we are by faith becoming to, uh, coming to realize more and more deeply the work that Christ is doing in us through that once for all sacrifice in the Holy Spirit. So what about the benefits? Let's look at number two, the benefits. What do we gain, right? What do we gain from participating in the Lord's Supper? Question 79 says, Why then does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood? Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life. So, um, we eat food. I'm assuming most of us do this, um, to sustain, right, our lives, um, to give us energy, um, to provide nutrition. We eat bread, and we drink to nourish our temporal life. So too, Christ's crucified body and blood do all these things for us. In the spiritual sense, um, when I think about the Lord's Supper, I often think about that scene in. Uh, Hook. Do you remember? Do you know that movie with uh, Robin Williams? And he grows up. He's Peter Pan. He grows up, and he goes. He goes back to uh, Neverland. And they're all sitting around a table. And uh, and Peter, he can't. Um, there's no food on this table. And it's not until. He overcomes his rigid adulthood way of thinking and taps back into his imagination that he sees a table full of the most scrumptious food you could possibly eat. And they just begin to start eating it. And they begin to get into a food fight and the food is flinging and flying everywhere. And I think in a very real sense that's a, that is a depiction for us of the Lord's Supper. Uh, somebody who's not a believer would walk in and, and see us um, taking a little piece of bread and eating it, taking a little cup of, of juice and, and drinking it and, and think it's absurd. It's just some sort of religious um, formalism. Nothing is actually really happening there. And that's because all their thinking is in the physical sense, natural, worldly. But if God were to redeem that person, unite them to Jesus Christ, his son, so that they become recipients of the perfect once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and then they become recipients of the Holy Spirit who's now indwelling them, that by faith they would see spiritually that what is happening in the Lord's Supper is not some sort of dead formalism, but is actually a meal that is spiritually sustaining our souls and uniting us to Jesus Christ, that there is actually something happening in the Lord's Supper. They would go from seeing just the picture of the Coke, right, to actually having the Coke. 
to what the picture actually represents. Not only are we reminded that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life, so too his crucified body and blood nourish our souls for eternal life. But more important, the catechism says, he wants to teach us He wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance and that all of his suffering and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. I think that's a great portion of the catechism that it says that. When we read Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 11, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, our high priest, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, his own body, He sat down at the right hand of God, poured out the Holy Spirit. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are being shown visibly that we are benefits, that we benefit, that that we are recipients of all the benefits of Christ. That we are those that the law has been written on our hearts and our minds and our sins and lawless acts have been remembered no more. And where these have been forgiven, where all sins and lawless acts have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin. There's been one final sacrifice for sin. And our participation in the Lord's Supper is a picture to us that, according to the Heidelberg Catechism, teaches us that we are sustained in our souls and also assures us and by a visible sign and pledge that we share in his body and blood and that all of his suffering and obedience are definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. The Lord's Supper is not just a picture of a Coke. The Lord's Supper is pointing us to the Coke. If this is the bread and wine. Participating in what we are receiving as benefits are found not in the picture, but in the Coke, who is Christ. Who is Christ. And lastly, let's talk about those who participate. Point three, the partakers in the Lord's Supper. The last two questions of Lord's Day 30 deal with this matter, and it's important for us to consider. Um, Is anyone, is anyone without any qualifications able to come to the Lord's Supper? Who are to come to the Lord's table?
These two things mentioned here in question and answer 81. Those who are displeased with their sins, but nevertheless trust their sins have been forgiven or pardoned, and that their continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ. And those who desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead to a better life can be wrapped up In one statement, those who are united to Christ by true faith. Those who are united to Christ by true faith are those who can come to the Lord's Supper. And it's important to emphasize that because as we get into the conversation about those who shouldn't, which the catechism mentions hypocrites and unrepentant. Um, Those are the ones who shouldn't. And then it'll go on and describe who those are, what that means, um, what that means, those who are hypocrites and unrepentant. This, is, uh, this, this situation has created all kinds of challenges and difficulties and, uh, and, and uh, hard feelings and hurt feelings in churches down through the ages um, because there's that tension between the, the freedom of God's grace and the responsibility that churches have to guard God's table from those who could be harmed um, by partaking in an unworthy manner. And, and, and the hard, the, the difficulty... F- in this, and the reason why it hasn't always been handled the best way is because, um, uh, believe it or not, elders don't have uh, regeneration glasses where they can tell who truly is united to Christ and, and has true faith. Elders don't have that. And all they have to go off of are um, outward actions and things which are done. And what they do with that is they determine that based on these certain outward actions and an unrepentant attitude um, and towards those things, um, we believe it's not safe for that person to partake in the Lord's Supper. And it's not, a, it's not a condemnation upon that person entirely because, once again, we don't have... We don't have regeneration goggles where we can see if someone's truly regenerated and, and it really has union with Christ by true faith. And, and the only way that we can do this is simply making judgment based on uh, things that are not of the heart, but on outward actions and unrepentant attitudes. And so, uh, for their own protection, and so, uh, for the desire that them seeing that the function of the elders holding the keys of the kingdom is to show them that they're in a dangerous situation right now, that they're going down a path or a direction that is, is not God's will, uh, God's revealed will, that they should turn away from that uh, because if they are true believers, they will desire to partake of the Lord's Supper and be sustained in their souls and united to his body. They will grieve not participating in that. Just like we're grieving right now that we have not been able to have the Lord's Supper for the last few months, someone who is truly united to Christ will grieve not being able to participate in that and will examine their lives and say, what is it, what's the direction that I'm going? What's the unrepentant attitude that I have? How am I acting in a hypocritical way? Um, and turn their lives towards God and towards Jesus Christ. And this isn't always done perfectly, but it's meant to be an act of, of grace and kindness. Um, it's not meant to be a, a final declaration of a person's eternal destiny. Uh, and what's so happened often in our day and age is that this sort of practice which God has instituted, a, a guarding of the Lord's table, 
um, which is to call unrepentant sinners back to Jesus Christ, back to a place where their heart can be softened, back to the place where they can live inside the, the will of God, God's revealed will for their lives, and to turn away from sins that are leading towards a dangerous path of death and destruction um, doesn't happen because it's easier for somebody to just simply just leave a church and go down the road to another church and never have to face um, the, the difficulty and the pain and the hurt of, of working through that, working through that process. Those to be admitted to the Lord's Supper who show by what they say and do that they are unbelieving and ungodly, no, that would dishonor God's covenant and bring down God's anger upon the entire congregation. Um, the statement there is being made because in 1 Corinthians 11, when people were participating in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, the, a sickness broke out in their church and people died. And Paul said that that was the judgment of God upon them for uh, participating in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Therefore, according to the instruction of Christ and his apostles, the Christian church is duty-bound to exclude such people by the official use of the keys of the kingdom until they reform their lives. Now, this has been abused because people have used this power to put out those that they simply dislike or, um, or don't care for. But the determination which is done by proving that people are unbelieving and ungodly, it's only supposed to be done according to God's word. You can't bar someone from the Lord's Supper because you're mad at them. You don't like them. But you can bar someone from the Lord's Supper if they are living in a fashion, a life, a style, not simply... We're all sinners, not simply a one-off sin, but a lifestyle, a re repetition of sinful character and sinful attitudes and sinful actions that express to the, the leaders, the, the elders of the congregation that you're living after repeated warnings, after repeated pleadings, after repeated um, uh, uh, opportunities of interaction and care and counseling and a desire to, to see what is um, best for you done and a, and, a, and a call for you to turn away over and over again. At the end of the line, the last final straw, one of the things that you do before you do your final thing of excommunication is that you, you bar someone from the Lord's Supper as an expression of care for them, their own safety. And as a desire that that would shock them out of their stupor, out of their uh, believing that this is something that's okay or not caring about what they're doing and the way that it's harming others and the way that it's, it's not supposed to be done, it's not supposed to happen. The partakers of the spiritual presence are supposed to be only those who are united to Christ by true faith. Now some of us have moments where we are hypocrites. Now we're all really hypocrites all the time. And some of us um, have moments where we fall face first into sin but the question is, what do we do with that sin? What do we do with those moments in which we find ourselves in the midst of our sin? What do we do in those moments when we realize that, that who we say we are as a Christian is not the way that we're living right now? Are we displeased with the sins that we have? We make no home with them. We're constantly asking for the Lord's forgiveness and the grace to overcome them. Yet nonetheless, in the midst 
of wrestling with our sin, mortifying our sin, killing our sin, we trust that we've been forgiven. And that our continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ. And even though we continue to fight against our sins and we're displeased with them, we desire to grow more and more in our faith and lead a better life. The Lord's Supper is is not meant to be the place where we come and we find that some Christians are uber-Christians and other Christians aren't so good. And only the really good Christians are the ones that can come to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is simply an opportunity for us to examine whether we are truly in the faith, whether we are united to Christ. And a way that we can examine whether we're united to Christ is by examining how displeased we are with our sins, the sins that God has chosen to reveal to us and continues to reveal to us in our lives. A way that we can examine if we are united to Christ is that nonetheless, even in the midst of those sins, we trust that we've been forgiven and that our continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ. And not only that, but in the midst of, of fighting and battling against our sin, we desire to grow more and more in our faith. The Lord's Supper is simply an opportunity for us to turn our eyes to Christ and ask ourselves the question, do we trust that his completed work on the cross has not only forgiven us of our sins, but redeemed us to a new life. That we now have the freedom to pursue in the grace of God. G.I. Williamson says, when you see that sign with a picture of a Coke, you get thirsty. But that doesn't mean that you actually have a drink. With the sacrament, it is different. When you take the bread and the wine, hungering and thirsting for union with the Lord Jesus Christ, you have it. You have it because that hunger and thirst is itself a reaching out to the Lord Jesus. And no one ever does that without receiving eternal salvation. Christ is spiritually present in the supper to sustain our souls and unite us to his body. We have in the Lord's Supper a picture of the once for all sacrifice he has given to us on the cross. The day that Christ went to the cross was the final Yom Kippur. The final day of atonement. And we have the promise that when, the, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Because by one sacrifice he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And what's pictured for us in that supper is that one sacrifice. And by faith, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, His spiritual presence sustains our souls and unites us to His body. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the love that you have shown us by giving us your Son. And thank you for the supper you have given us in your grace that we may know, that we may know that all of his sufferings in obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. It's 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.